Um, if you're here in person, we're excited to have you. Welcome back. And if you're listening on YouTube, uh, we want to thank you for getting on. If you like what you see tonight, give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, go ahead and do that. And that allows us to determine future content in a better way. Uh, tonight, I'm really excited uh, to introduce our speaker. And uh, I, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Connie Weaver. Uh, Dr. Weaver is a distinguished research professor in exercise and nutritional sciences at San Diego State University in San Diego, California. She's a distinguished professor emerita of nutritional science at Purdue University, Indiana, and the CEO of Weaver and Associates Consulting. Connie Weaver, Dr. Weaver, is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine since 2010. She's a fellow of the American Society for Nutrition, the Institute of Food Technologists, the American Heart Association, and the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research. She's a member of the Science Advisory Boards of, F of the FDA, California Prune Board, California Walnut Board, and Produce for Better Health Foundation. Dr. Weaver is past president of the American Society for Nutrition. So no further ado, will you please welcome our fabulous speaker, Dr. Weaver, and let me just pin you and put you up here. Uh, and so can you see my screen okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for taking time to have a conversation with us tonight. I want to um, warn you, I have a bit of a cold, and so my voice is kind of scratchy. I hope that you can understand it through that scratch. So I'm going to talk about the role of diet in preventing osteoporosis, what's enough and what's too little, because I studied both um, sides of that question. Okay, I need to, <laughs> my slides aren't advancing. We didn't, oh, there it goes. So she's already told you my affiliations, so I won't dwell on that. Um, nutrition across the lifespan is important. Early on, it's to grow and develop um, bone until a peak bone mass is achieved by early adulthood. And then the goal is to hold on to the bone as long as you can. And those are the two main strategies for preventing osteoporosis for low bone density. In childhood, 89% increase in fracture risk per each standard deviation below the median bone mineral density. So 30 to 50% of children have at least one fracture. And so they have relatively low bone density. We care about that, but they heal so rapidly. Most people sort of ignore that age. But a 5 to 10% difference in peak bone mass at the time they're young adults can result in a 25 to 50% lower risk of fracture rate later in life. So that's the real goal during youth. The two rapid bone turnover periods are during puberty. There's high bone turnover and then um, immediately following the menopause for several years. And because those are periods of high bone turnover, there is the thinking that you could have the biggest impact during those periods with diet or exercise. So those are the two periods I've studied the most. Starting with adolescence. I led this group of people uh, commissioned by the National Osteoporosis Foundation to do all these meta-analyses on 19 different lifestyle factors to grade the evidence for what is most influential in building peak bone mass. So of the nutrients or dietary patterns, calcium is the only one that got an A grade because there were many studies, was, they were very consistent. Um, and next up was vitamin D and dairy. Physical activity got an A grade as well. And almost all the others got a C or a D grade, meaning very few trials or 
non-existent data to make an opinion. We've found subgroup differences in disease risk relate to the response to diet. And that's the basis for what's really popular now of personalized nutrition. So I'm gonna tell you what we know in this context for bone. A lot of them came out, a lot of the studies came out of my lab. I ran these metabolic controlled diet feeding studies for many summers. I ran 11 summer camps, we called them Camp Calcium, where we controlled their diet and asked different questions. We studied girls and boys, whites, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics. And we asked, what are the nutritional requirements in adolescents, especially calcium and vitamin D? The impact of those studies were the data were used to set the calcium requirements for adolescents for North America in 1997. And those values still hold today. The values we found were used for the in the 2004 Surgeon General's report on bone health, and it's been used since 2005 dietary guidelines for Americans. So here's how we conducted these studies. We bring the kids to Purdue and live in a residence hall or a sorority um, all summer for the most part. So they would come in, we'd put them on a controlled diet for three weeks, they'd go home for a washout period, from one to three weeks, and then they would come back and switch over to a different diet. So sometimes we were varying the calcium content, sometimes the salt, sometimes the vitamin D, and so forth. And I'm gonna pick just a few of the main results. But the whole time they were there, we measured everything um, very precisely that went into their mouth and everything that came out for all those weeks of the summer all the urine, all the stools. And after a week when they were calibrated on the diet, we gave them isotopic uh, calcium tracers, um, non-radioactive stable isotopes. And then we could follow that into the blood and urine to get at calcium absorption, bone formation rates, bone resorption, and everything that was happening to calcium. So one question we ask, what's the role of sex in uh, calcium metabolism. We knew from the literature that bone mineral density um, increased really sharply in puberty, very narrow range, and boys higher but later than girls. So you know about sixth grade girls shoot up in height and then boys catch up by eighth grade because they're a year and a half behind. And we asked the question, does this higher rate of peak bone mass gain in boys mean they need more calcium or do they use it more efficiently than girls? So we brought boys and girls in and studied them on a range of calcium intake and the girls in pink at every calcium intake had a lower rate of calcium retention or bone accretion than the boys. And it was constant that boys were more efficient by 171 milligrams of calcium a day. But the plateau occurred for both at the same intake, 1,300 milligrams a day. And that's the current requirements, is how can you maximize bone accretion with calcium and the rest of it on higher levels just gets excreted? Well, what about race? We know from the literature that there's a difference between non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, and Mexican-Americans. So Mexican Americans have a higher incidence of osteoporosis and blacks have a lower incidence and kind of similar with low bone mass. So we brought in black and white pubertal girls that were matched for the same bone mineral density and sexual maturity. And we learned across calcium intakes that black girls were more efficient at retaining calcium than the white girls, the same as the difference between boys versus girls, blacks were more efficient than whites on the same calcium intakes. So calcium intake explained about 12.3% of the variation in calcium retention and race explained about 13.7%. So roughly equal. Now salt is a big thing these days. There's a lot of information about salt being bad for bones, but also risk for high blood pressure. 
So we brought um, black and white girls to Camp Calcium and studied them on a low sodium diet of 1.3 grams of sodium per day, which was about the fifth percentile of adolescent intake in the U.S. And the crossover was on high sodium, high salt diets at four grams of sodium a day. And we gave the salt through soups and Gatorade. Otherwise, the diets were the same. They really liked the salty soup and didn't like the salty Gatorade. So they were always happy and not so happy about one food in like the whole study. And we found really fascinating racial differences. This first figure is urinary sodium excretion. On the low sodium diet, they didn't excrete much and blacks and whites excreted the same amount. But on the high sodium diet, the whites could excrete all the extra salt, but the blacks could not. They started hoarding sodium. They couldn't excrete it. And that stayed constant throughout the whole three weeks we had them on these diets. Well, calcium and sodium share the same transporters. So when the whites are throwing all that calcium uh, salt, the sodium out in the urine, it's pulling calcium out with it. So here's urinary calcium. The whites on the high salt have really high calcium losses in their urine and the blacks don't have very much loss. So when you look at total calcium retention, which means bone accretion, bone building, both races were influenced by high salt diets It decreased, but blacks are so much more efficient at utilizing calcium than whites. And even on the high salt diet, their ability to grow bone was higher than whites on the low salt diet. Well, this underpins the basic pro um, racial differences between osteoporosis and high blood pressure. So while whites eat a lot of salt and throw that sodium out in the urine and pull the calcium out with it, they become more vulnerable to osteoporosis compared to the blacks. But the blacks holding on to all that sodium is uh, holding on to the water too and increases blood pressure. And blacks are known to have a higher incidence of blood pressure, high blood pressure than whites. Well, there are two other minerals that are involved in um, fluid control and that's sodium and potassium. So we don't have quite as much data on sodium and potassium. We know the blood pressure reduction is greater in blacks than whites and those that start out at higher blood pressure. So in this case, we're trying to get the potassium up because it balances the salt and the sodium down. Only 3% of Americans met the recommended intake for potassium. We started looking at it in 2003 to 2006 in the national survey, and that's maintained the truth through since. But 90% exceed the upper level recommendation for salt. So we don't eat to help our bones and salt. In terms of overall nutritional benefit for bone, there's really good scientific evidence that calcium matters, vitamin D, potassium matters, and we don't get enough. Sodium, too much is a problem, and we get too much. Magnesium, we are borderline deficient, and we need more. And phosphorus, most people get a lot of phosphorus, but it's through um, colas and processed foods. So the source isn't so helpful. There's a variety of sources that provide these essential nutrients. Supplements often have calcium, maybe calcium plus vitamin D, sometimes calcium plus vitamin D plus magnesium. Fortified foods like orange juice or cereals might have calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. You have to look at the label because they don't naturally have the vitamin D and potassium or the calcium for, in the case of orange juice. But dairy is recommended by all the uh, diet dairy guidelines panels because it provides this whole package of nutrients that are important for bone health. So whereas supplements may only have calcium and vitamin D, dairy has a whole slew of nutrients that are important for bone health. And so if you look at a map of the globe, of where the most intake of milk is, 
you can see who's going to have the least problem getting their requirements. So North America has more and Europe has more, but whole sections of Africa, Southeast Asia, some places in South America are very low milk consumers. So they are exceedingly low in their calcium intakes. Calcium um, is a constant portion of bone. So if you understand what's happening to calcium, you know what's happening to bone. If you're retaining more, you're building bone. If you're losing calcium, you're losing bone because it's a constant fraction. And the recommended um, dairy intakes or calcium intakes um, are here for the different age groups and the sources, dairy, fortified foods, broccoli and kale, and of course supplements if you don't choose these. Well, because calcium is a constant fraction of bone, it's a functional reserve. Calcium is about a third of the bone mineral. And there's a linear relationship between bone mineral density and fracture risk. So if you have to keep pulling calcium out of your bone to keep your blood levels constant, which is life demanding, then you're um, cheating the bones if they're like a bank and you draw in year after year and you're gonna have weaker bones. So here's a global picture of calcium intakes by country in men and women with the dash line being the recommended intake. And it's kind of like I showed you for that global picture of milk, it sort of parallels who, what countries are most deficient. It's not just the total calcium in the food or the diet, it's how well is it absorbed. So I've spent a lot, lot of my career studying calcium absorption from all the different major sources. So here shows you, I took um, a lactating dairy cow and infused this calcium tracer into the cow and collected the milk. So now it's labeled with heavy calcium. And I grew a whole bunch of plants hydroponically and put the tracer in there so the plants could take it up. And here it shows you an extreme comparison. Given at the same calcium load, calcium from milk was absorbed about 30% and spinach tenfold less, you know, like 3% because it's all bound up by the oxalic acid in spinach. So it's not just the total calcium that matters. Here's kind of an abbreviated bioavailability chart. So the dairy foods have about 300 milligrams of uh, calcium per serving, like milk and yogurt, one and a half ounces of cheese. And fractional absorption is around 30, 32%. So if you multiply those, the amount of absorbable calcium per serving is about 96 milligrams. And so to make it kind of easier to compare, I assigned milk and yogurt a relative value of one. And then I compared all these other foods that we labeled in our hydroponic system or we sent made in the lab like they would for fortified foods. And most of them have a lot lower calcium content. Fractional calcium absorption might be high at the really low content. So when you multiply it, the number of servings you need to replace one glass of milk for absorbable calcium is like 12 and a half cups of dried beans, four and a half cups of servings of broccoli, et cetera. The only way you can replace dairy with foods is to go to fortified foods like calcium set tofu or orange juice. We studied uh, one plant-based beverage, the soy beverage, and found that calcium absorption was equal between cow's milk and the soy beverage, especially if it was fortified with calcium carbonate. A little bit less if it was fortified with tricalcium phosphate, but still pretty good. But none of the other plant-based beverages have been measured for calcium absorption. So we don't know if they're a good equivalent for the calcium bioavailability in milk. We do know that some of them are really much lower in potassium. So you have almond and coconut um, milk are really low in potassium. Some of them are pretty high in sodium but they're all a lot more expensive relative to cow's milk. So that's a factor. Now I'm going to switch over to the postmenopausal women age, which you might be more interested in, except for your grandchildren and 
so forth. Um, and we have found several bioactive compounds and foods that can really stretch the calcium. It will help you utilize the calcium better, especially if you aren't a big dairy consumer or a pill taker. So these bioactive foods have some sort of functional properties. And we developed a fast way of measuring their efficacy compared to the traditional. The usual way FDA wants a drug tested and they like it, nutrition tested this way, but most um, nutrition manufacturers can't afford these kinds of studies. Because bone turns over at only 26% a year for the spongy trabecular bone, and even less, the 3% per year for cortical bone, like in your long limbs, then you have to have a long time to see changes by bone scans, bone mineral density scans using DEXA. So FDA's approved approach to study interventions is a four year randomized controlled trial of bone mineral density. That is very expensive and it takes hundreds of people per group. Well, we developed a 50 and now 42 day screening method to evaluate efficacy of diets. We use this really big instrument. There's one at Purdue University and one in California uh, called an accelerator mass spectrometer. And this big machine can measure atom quantities, whoops, I didn't mean to go yet, atom quantities of rare isotopes like calcium 41. So what we do is label a person's bones with the calcium 41 and then measure what comes out in the urine and that's direct loss of bone. So the first big study we did in postmenopausal women and this zero line is what the woman's usual rate of bone loss was. So we could compare these interventions against her own usual rate of loss. Well, estrogen was fabulous. You know, it stopped bone loss by 28%. Um, bisphosphonate, this is one example, stopped it by almost as much, 25%. But the dietary supplements that, supplements that were being sold at this time um, and claiming to be good for postmenopausal women bone loss, soy cod leaden, it was significant, not as significant as the drugs, but people can tolerate being for decades on these nutritional supplements and they don't have the same risks of, um, associated with the drugs and they're not that so expensive. Soy germ also was significant, but red clover and kudzu that were being marketed then subsequently were taken off the market because we showed they didn't do any good. So I'm gonna show you um, three natural or supplement or diet choices that you could make to help protect against bone loss. One is soluble corn fiber. So we published this study in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition where we did a dose response effect of soluble corn fiber. It's a prebiotic, meaning you don't digest it. It goes into the lower gut and stimulates your gut microbiota in order to absorb calcium in your lower gut. And how we did it is we crossed the women over. So one period they're on zero grams of this fiber, another period 10 grams, and another period 20 grams in a randomized order for the 50-day intervention, collecting their urine to find out how much bone loss there was. So we gave the soluble corn fiber in beverages or muffins and you can get it online or in any major store and just sprinkle it on anything or dissolve it in your um, water. This is a very inert, tasteless powder, white powder. So here's the benefit to bone in terms of retaining bone is a dose response benefit, which was enough to say we can completely stop bone loss on average in these women by soluble corn fiber. So the FDA used our studies to say soluble corn fiber meets dietary fiber definition on the nutrient facts label based on calcium absorption and retention. 
<laughs> so we're really proud of that. And it stimulated two different one-year trials in children um, that are ongoing. Um, and Schaefer here, oh, whoops, in, in California, tested it in bariatric patients because bariatric patients your calcium absorption pre-surgery goes from 30% absorption to 7% after the surgery. So we really need to figure out a way to improve calcium utilization in these subjects. And I don't know that soluble core fiber is going to do it, but we were trying it. And then in a, a mouse model, Laura McCabe at Michigan State used soluble core fiber to show it prevented bone problems in type 1 diabetic mice. So another exciting application. So the next bioactive I want to tell you about, we're about ready to submit the paper on this, was in blueberries. So we used the calcium 41 technology where we labeled the bone of these postmenopausal women and then tested them in random order, a low, medium, and a high dose of blueberries. So these were whole freeze-dried blueberries equivalent to three quarters a cup one and a half cups or three cups that we worked into a beverage, granola bites, or a spread twice a day. And lo and behold, the low dose of three quarters a cup was very effective at stopping bone loss. The three cups, a little bit, it was significant, not quite as good as the lower dose. And by the high dose, it's like your body transport was saturated and it no longer had a benefit. So three quarters of a cup of blueberry will do the same sort of thing that the soluble corn fiber uses. And now prunes, this paper just came out at the end of 2022, which it was a one year long trial comparing, comparing control, 50 grams of prunes, which is about five prunes or a hundred grams of prunes, which is 10 to 12 prunes. And where we saw the biggest difference was total hip bone mineral density, which is where you worry the most about a fracture. The control group kept losing, but the prunes stopped the loss significantly. And um, it seemed like the lower dose, the five or six prunes a day is just as good. So that's all you need. So in conclusion, lifestyle factors make a difference for risk of fracture, hypertension, other chronic diseases. Nutrients important to bone are often deficient, like calcium, potassium, magnesium, due to diet choices, and low soil available minerals. And I didn't tell you about that whole study, but that when they're switching away from potash, they're putting less potassium in the soil. So the, our plants are going down and down and potassium is partly why we're deficient and getting hypokalemia. Mineral nutrient sustainability depends on not only total intake, but also bioavailability. It can really vary. And subgroup differences in response to diet impact health and are the basis of personalized nutrition. We developed a rapid method for evaluating the interventions to stop bone loss in postmenopausal women. And it showed promise for soy, soluble corn fiber, and blueberries, and prunes reduce bone loss at the total hip. So I just wanna thank all the funders, mostly NIH, and all my visiting science, scientists, postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduate students and collaborators who worked on these studies. So Shella, you're muted. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> and, uh... Let's say. Um, in a minute. All right. And for some reason, I'm having a little trouble. The slideshow is that continuing? Oh, yeah, it looks like it needs to be ended. Okay, stop sharing. How about that? Oh, there, we there go. you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. That was packed with information, and it was phenomenal. 
I'm so grateful. And I, I want to say that everybody on here is really excited. All of our live people want to speak with you or want to at least send me chat questions. I can tell from that exciting lecture. So anyway, I want to thank anybody listening on YouTube. We're going to uh, let you go. Um, and uh, we want to say, give us a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you want to subscribe, and I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you so much. Okay, questions uh, starting from here are, in, um, does Dr. Weaver feel there is something we can do or need to do to get calcium to our bones? Oh, I think you answered that though. I think I did, but yeah. I want to <laughs> also give a plug for weight bearing exercise. But actually, oh. they don't, they know weight bearing exercise is good, but nobody's studied comparative types of exercise. And so I've submitted a grant that's pending. I don't know if I'll get it, but I wanted to compare using this calcium 41 technique is resistance exercise or treadmill or cycling or uh, dynamic exercise. Does it matter? In some cases, if you lose bone like cycling because it's unloaded and others you gain. And there haven't been any direct comparisons for bone. All the advice is about cardiovascular. <laughs> Interesting. Um, you know, I was excited to see so much that was possible from, um, from food itself. Those several of those, the prunes, the blueberries, and the soluble corn fiber. I'm wondering why that isn't common knowledge. Right. It, well, some of it's just now coming out. I mean, we're just about to submit the blueberry paper. That'll be the first clinical trial ever with blueberries and bones. And the prune study just came out a couple of months ago. And um, so it, it, the soluble corn fiber came out in 2016 and the FDA gave it this honor of calling it a dietary fiber that can go on the label of products that use it. So that was quite an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we need more um, knowledge sharing for that. But, but I, I wanna tell you, don't use all those products at the same time. <laughs> Oh, really? Okay. For your gut, you know, it, they're probably mostly working through the gut microbiome. So you can mix it up, like one day do the prunes, another day do the blueberries, <laughs> or smaller doses of each. But if you tried to do all of them, you might have some uh, complaints from your gut. <laughs> right. uh, none, of, none of the studies, well, except for a few people on the 12 plum, dried plums, the prunes a day, of a small number didn't like that. But at the dose we found effective, you know, the five-ish, uh, nobody was complaining about the gut. But I just didn't want you to say, I'm going to take the blueberries and the plums and the soluble <laughs> corn fiber all at the same time. I was all in on that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, we're always at thinking, what are we going to do? What can we eat? That can help. Um, and of course, that's exciting to see. So just to go over, I just want to make sure that I understand that with the soluble corn fiber, how much of that is recommended to add to either water or whatever? So 10 grams a day was quite effective. Okay. And the blueberries was three quarters of a cup? Correct. And, and the, the prunes, prunes like five to six a day or mix it up. So I see some of these questions. They're great. Okay. Yes. So I have lactose intolerance and high cholesterol. So what do you do about dairy recommendations? So you would want to pick the low fat um, options. And now manufacturers have figured out a way to remove the lactose. They um, have microfiltration that removes the sugars and concentrates the protein and the calcium a little bit. So the brand I buy for that is, um, Fair life. Uh, uh, what'd you say? Fair what life. Is Fair Fair life. life. Yeah. Fair life. I put in a question about Fair Life milk. That's what I use. Yeah. And I think there are probably other ones. I just know that. And that's what we commonly purchase because of that. That's great. That's great. I'm, and I've heard 
Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I don't care. You could ask him if you want. I've heard that if kale and collards are blanched, that it destroys the oxalates and makes calcium more bioavailable. Yeah, that's not true. That oxalate isn't going anywhere from a heat process. So let's expand on this discussion a little bit. If you eat calcium at the same time as oxalic acid, like with spinach or um, some of the other plant foods, the calcium and the oxalate bind up and it's going to, um, you're not going to absorb as much calcium quite, but more importantly, if you've got kidney stones, it's going to take the oxalate out with it. And most kidney stones are made of oxalic acid. So be sure and consume your calcium along with your green vegetables that have oxalate. Now, kale doesn't have oxalate. So it's absorption of calcium is very high. It just doesn't have the concentrated amount of it that milk does. Um, so in so, other words, is it true that we, you know, we've, we've, we've been under the impression not to have spinach with our calcium dose? Is oh that no, that's exactly yeah. when you, well, okay, it'll compromise the calcium from the supplement or the milk a little bit, but if you're at risk for kidney stones, that's exactly what you want to do is eat them together to bind up the calcium or the oxalate because it really will reduce kidney stone. But of course, the biggest thing you can do for preventing kidney stones is drink a lot of water. So you're diluting all those solids. But calcium plus the oxalate vegetables is the way to go if you're prone. But to, in, in terms of someone who's not prone for kidney stones, what would be your recommendation with spinach? Well, well, if you get enough calcium in the form of dairy or fortified food or supplements, I wouldn't worry about it very much. Okay, that's good to know. And then um, could you repeat the recommended dose of soy cotyledon? Uh, okay, if you look at soy uh, supplements, they're not going to be called that. That's the part of the uh, seed that most of the supplements are made of. And... Uh, now I kind of forget what the dose was. It was whatever was recommended on the package at the time. I was trying to be real world relevant. So, so probably example, follow. If it's, if it's soy milk a cup or whatever it says. Um, soy milk may not have as much isoflavones. It I, I think they make it with and without isoflavones. And it's probably the isoflavones in there, the polyphenols that are acting on improving calcium. So they may not all be the same, but you can look at the label and if it says it has soy isoflavones, it's probably gonna be helpful to okay. your bone. Good to know. Um, let's see, what else do I see here? Um, yes, I guess that is a good question. I did never even thought of that. Are, are, do all of these findings apply to someone who already has osteoporosis or is this still building bone in, in people that are younger and not already diagnosed? So um, we don't have a lot of data on premenopausal women. And I have a grant proposal that I just submitted to look at the effect of estrogen status on blueberry utilization for bone. So I say we don't know enough about whether it's going to help premenopausal women. Although the rat, the rodent studies suggest that it will work. So probably it will. It just hasn't been looked at in humans yet. So I see this question about should we focus on some key foods? I, I would say don't ignore your calcium. Don't take blueberries and prunes and stuff instead of making sure you get enough calcium. They work together. So be sure you get your calcium. But then if you don't get quite enough, you know, you're skimping on the dairy or you don't remember your supplements every day or whatever, then these foods will really help you. And they might work in a different mechanism. So they could be synergistic. And so the person who asked about the drugs, um, if you already have osteoporosis and you're on drugs, 
this is likely a good synergistic thing to do with the drugs. And almost all drugs now, the doctors are recommending a drug holiday if you've been on it at least two years. And then they want you to take a break because they're worried about the side effects and stuff. I would say especially think about these foods during that holiday period because now you don't have the drugs. Right. Excellent. Um, so someone asked, I've heard that if kale or collards are blanched, that it destroys the oxalates and makes calcium more bioavailable. No. No. Cooking not, yeah, cooking is not going to affect that. But I see a question on sprouting. And sprouting makes nutrients more available if the inhibitor is phytic acid, which is the phosphate <laughs> storage form in seeds. And that's got a low inhibitory effect for calcium relative to oxalate. So I would say it, maybe a touch it would help, but it's not a big deal like it would be for zinc or something, some other mineral, copper and zinc. Uh, let's see. How effective are fortified food versus non-fortified? Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, well, in the ones where there have been studies, I can tell you. So calcium fortified orange juice has been tested and it's as good as calcium from cow's milk. Calcium from soy beverage, we tested and it was as good. The other fortified plant-based beverages have not been tested. Um, cereals, um, kind of a mixed bag. Some are pretty good. Some are really high in phytate, might not be quite as good, but overall it's important to get enough calcium from some of these sources. <laughs> so pick them. And uh, Dr. Reaver, am I to understand when you're talking about comparing soy milk, for example, that these, this is soy milk that you compared that had a high amount of isoflavones in, in it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, I was just going to say, and it does say that on the ingredient side of the... Well, the big panel. thing to look for is if, it's, if calcium is added, because they can set it into that cheese-like curd with either calcium or magnesium. If they set it with calcium, it's a really rich source of calcium. If they set it with magnesium, it's a rich source of magnesium, but not calcium. So it depends what you're going for. You need to look at the label. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody was asking about the tofu being plain and somebody was asking about milk and um, yogurt earlier. The fat and sugar don't matter for how well the calcium is absorbed. You might worry about sugar for some other reason, but not for your calcium or your bones. Okay, that's good to know. Um, the 1200 milligram a day um, stipulation for calcium, um, I don't, I'm not sure I understand why someone said, do you use bioavailable calcium? Does someone want to clarify what they mean? Does that it? mean, does the manufacturer use well-absorbed calcium? They, they pretty, all the big name manufacturers now pretty much have tested it. It used to be that some were really not good because they either compressed the tablet too tight and they couldn't bite, um, dissolve in your stomach or they would put in um, adjuvants to make it hold together and that would bind the calcium and then it wasn't absorbed. So we went through some really rough periods with its poor bioavailable supplements, but I think they've pretty much been solved now. So if, if it's a big name, a supplement provider, I probably would trust it that it's pretty absorbable. That's great. Thank you. Um, someone asked about vitamin K and getting that from uh, NATO, NATO. Yeah. Um, NATO. I've seen a lot of no, in other words, no effect vitamin K studies. I'm still open to the idea that some, both some amount 
will help, but there is a whole lot of negative trials on vitamin K. So I'm not ready to, and most panels that recommend nutrients aren't willing yet to say that the evidence is strong enough to promote vitamin K for bone. Mm. And um, someone asked about calcium supplements. Do you, do you favor some over others? If, if you, you know. I, I would do what you could comply with. You know, do you need swallow pills or chewable or gummies or the cost or the flavor? You know, I think there's not enough difference among them anymore to worry about it. Okay. And the, and also, um, is there anything like that for magnesium? Because, and do you recommend magnesium as a supplement? So women get about two thirds on average of the magnesium recommendations. So they're borderline deficient. So if you get your dairy recommendations and you consume, um, uh, green leafy vegetables and whole grains, you probably, and nuts, you'll get enough magnesium. But if you avoid all those foods, then you better look at a supplement. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, let's see what someone else wrote. Um, it says, I presume most of us have osteoporosis given there's no diet studies. Oh, I think we talked about that. Um, and I think we talked about almond milk as well. There was a chart you had up about almond milk. And no, only soy beverage of the plant-based has been studied for calcium absorption. So we don't know. And you have to look then at what's the level of potassium? What's the level of sodium? What's the cost? Because it's kind of unknown mm -hmm. about how good of a substitute they are. And even though we're talking about supplemental calcium that's added to the almond milk or the oat milk or whatever it should be, you're still saying this, these things are not tested. Correct. Okay. All right. And then are plant-based calcium supplements um, equal to calcium that you would derive from dairy? So the cheapest form of calcium is calcium carbonate that comes from rocks. You know, they mine, I've been to these places where they mine the rocks and pure clean it up and then go through a lot of filtration and stuff, steps to make the pure white powder and grind it up and distribute it to all these manufacturers of supplements. Plants have so little calcium in them, I can't imagine that they would go through the cost of concentrating the calcium in the plant into a pill. So I'm not quite sure an example of that. I don't know of any that I can think of. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any either. Does anyone who posed that question have anything they'd like to add on that? Are there some supplements made of uh, algae? Like, um, would that be? There, so algae supplements are usually to give like protein and some mineral combination, but you'd have to look at the amount. I think, I think you wouldn't be able to depend on it for calcium because you couldn't eat enough of it for the amount of calcium that's in there to, to have it your, be your main calcium source because you would start having way too many amino acids and proteins and DNA and stuff building up. If, if you were trying to get all your calcium that way. I, I've never seen it on a list of what people, dietitians or anybody recommend for how to get calcium. Um, we've been, you know, there's a lot written about strontium. Uh, have you seen in any of your studies anything about that? As what do you, call, what are you saying? Strontium. Oh, strontium, yeah. Yes. So strontium, it, it'll go replace calcium in the bone. And there's a, historically, there's been a lot of controversy if that was good, neutral, or bad, that you could replace it. So I've seen reports of trials using strontium that may have some benefit for calcium, but, or for bone, but 
I don't know. It's uh, safer for sure to think about calcium, I would say, than the strontium. Right. Um, and let's see. Shelly, uh, you skipped over one of the questions, which I've always been curious about what has sure. to do with calcium in the blood, measured in the bloodstream, if that has any bearing on how you're absorbing calcium or, or not or whatever. So calcium in the blood is controlled at a very narrow range. You have to have a constant amount of calcium that bathes all your tissues for all the life processes. If you go too high, you get pet me. If you go too low, you get hypocalcemia. Your body fails if it gets outside of that range. So your body's gonna do whatever it has to do to keep calcium in that narrow, narrow range. So blood levels of calcium don't tell you anything for the most part because they're controlled you know, you're way out of whack if you get out of the reference range for calcium in the blood. Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, I would like to say, someone asked about prolia. I don't think, let me just say, I don't think that we are going to address drugs specifically on this is that we're talking more about diet and exercise. So I studied prolia when I was developing that method for labeling the bone and following the tracer out in the urine. And so I wanted to test things that would really dramatically improve bone retention or cause it to be lost to make sure that my marker of the isotope was cracking. So I know prolio shut down the bone loss of calcium, so, but generally I'm not trained in drugs, as you point out. Mine is lifestyle interventions. Well, and we appreciate everything you're sharing with us, believe me. You're welcome. So, so good and so clear. Um, I, are calcium fortified milks and foods as beneficial as naturally occurring calcium, in your opinion? Uh, so I'd go study by study. What's the form that they put in? What's the level? Many studies are positive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they seem pretty good for the most part. There have been some disasters, but usually people figure it out and they're not on the market very often long. And then there's calcium carbonate versus calcium citrate and what is more absorbable with food and without. Um... So I had a lab, a class do a debate once and assigned half the class had to say calcium citrate was better absorbed calcium and the other half had to say it was the same and they found equal number of studies on both sides but the state of the art method is with the tracers and so all the tracer studies showed um, that they were about the same when when you consume calcium with food um, they'd be about the same on an empty stomach, it depends if you have um, low gastric pH. Then um, calcium acid, citrate would be better, easier on your kidneys than calcium carbonate. So if you're in that situation, if you consume it with food, it's going to buffer it and it won't be a problem. But on an empty stomach, if you have kidney issues, calcium citrate will be e more gentle. Excellent. Um, someone asked if there's a, if you liked a specific corn fiber product. Well, it, the one I s studied so much in animal models and kids and um, postmenopausal women was 
um, is made by Tate and Lyle. If you like, I could send you a slide of all the products at Walmart and CVC and everything, because it, it's not obvious. So I have a corn fiber. It's not the title of the product. But I can send you pictures if you wanted to share it with people of where you might find it in different places. But I also have friends that just order it online. It's real cheap, they say. So as long as it, it has that composition, it doesn't matter the brand. Is that yeah, right. Name? Yeah, Tate and Lyle sold it to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and how about, uh, what's your take on prebiotics in general? Do you think well, they're a good thing for us to take? So soluble corn fiber is a prebiotic and it works well. We've also studied galacto-oligosaccharides that are derived from dairy. They work just as well in kids. We didn't test postmenopausal women, but other people have and found it advantageous. Um, so those are the main ones I know. I know some of the prebiotic starches that don't work. So it's not like every single one is going to work, but many of them seem to work. What was that second one? Could you say that again, please? Galacto oligosaccharide, G O S for short. G O S, okay. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll replay that. Okay. Uh, okay, and then let's see. Um, I see somebody has, in addition to salt, what other things should you stay away from? Good question. Um, Nothing is as detrimental as salt. Oxalic acid is very big inhibitor for absorption, but just make sure you get enough calcium and you probably aren't gonna eat only spinach salad breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So you can have an occasional spinach salad and get away with it. That's good. I think I've been avoiding uh, spinach since I was diagnosed. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> yeah, just make sure you get enough milk or something else while you're consuming it. I think we have everything. Maybe there's one question. Um... Is corn the critical factor in the um, that? You know, no, I, I knew the chemist that um, manipulated the corn fiber. So you couldn't just eat corn and have it work. It's a concentrated, modified um, ingredient. And so it only would be useful as a supplement. That's great. Um, I noticed in your, um, in all the accolades I've read up about you, that you've done quite a bit of research and exercise as well uh, in different areas, but more, yep. more in nutrition probably. But yeah. um, is there anything just in closing you'd like to share about that aspect? Well, I sort of talked about this grant that I submitted. I mean, we know weight bearing exercise is really good, but we don't have data that relatively compares the different kinds of exercise for bone. We just know weight bearing is good. Mm -hmm. And so I hope to be part of the results that compare them someday. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's helpful. Um, I can't tell you how wonderful this talk was. Oh, good. <laughs> this was fabulous. Uh, you have given us so much food, food for thought. How's that? Oh, very good. <laughs> Well, I'll and, send you um, that slide right away that you can share with thank you. everyone. And um, the, um, you know, they're very lucky to have you in California. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and we really applaud your research and we wish you so much the best on that whole, on all the future pursuits that you endeavor. Thank you. Take. I appreciate so, it. Thank you so much for being part of our group tonight. And um, if you ever feel like you'd like to share again, we'd love to have you. Okay, thank you. I'll send you that slide right now. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Connie.